Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the show. Got an awesome episode today with Michael Garfield, host of Future Fossils. It's a real interesting dude, super smart, and uh, we just uh, we just kind of jammed and went went off the cuff wherever the conversation went to, and we wound up talking about uh, some things I guess that have been on both of our minds. What Michael talks about a lot on his show is the interconnected web of all things, you know. And uh, Michael is a paleontologist, a artist, an author, a speaker, um, yeah, just like seems like a real kind of renaissance guy always creating uh, tons of different kinds of content uh and i i hate to call it content because it's so much more than that but his artistic expression uh that unfolds and emerges and and merges with his universe and the reality that he's creating is immense he works at the santa fe institute he's written uh papers he's um you know, done all, a lot of a lot of things. So uh, his show, Future Fossils, is he's talking with a, a lot of really interesting people. Some people that I've had on the show here, other people like uh, Kevin Kelly, um, the uh, founder of Wired Magazine and author of uh, books like What Technology Wants and and other things like that. But uh, he has he has really really interesting conversations on his show. Uh, Corey Allen's been on his show, uh, former guest of the show. And um, so a lot of really other good people talking about the future of things. What what is where are we? Where were we? And what how do we relate to our environments? And how do we what what are the new myths for this new collective intelligence that has emerged through the internet and this connectivity that we are experiencing in this kind of rapidly changing complex time that we find ourselves in where sometimes it could be too overwhelming and it could be you know we're we're just kind of swimming in this information creativity explosion ever since we uh, have been connected i mean we've been doing this as human beings for a while but uh with this uh new this new kind of planetary uh, connectedness. So Michael has conversations that are really deep and enlightening and rich and and full of, of insights and wisdom, uh, connecting all the realms of, of his areas of expertise, which are vast art and music and science and technology, and learning about uh, what can we do and how can we do uh, things that are agreeable to our human nature, but also help us progress, right? We've been talking about progress on the show um, and, and what that means and how do we measure progress and what do we decide is valuable for progress. Anyway, awesome conversation. You guys are going to love it. Michael Garfield is just a, an awesome human being and I hope to, uh, to talk to him again and uh, yeah, do it again because it's always interesting with these podcasts when you first talk to somebody, sometimes the first conversation, maybe you only have one episode that you record with them. But I, I, there's been guests on this show that I've liked and that I've enjoyed and that I want to start having back more on the show. I mean, there's tons of guests that I want to have on the show that I haven't talked to yet. One of them that comes to mind or two of them that I'm thinking of is Gabor Mate and David Graber. Uh, and I would love to have those guys on the show. So I'm going to start to, to get them on Jamie wheel. I'd love to have Jamie wheel on the show. Um, and some other guys, I think Jason Silva, Jason Silva, uh, I think started a podcast recently actually. And so I, I'd love to maybe have him on the show as well as, as he gets his podcast chops down, but there's so many great thinkers and authors and creators and connectors out there, uh, that we want to have conversations with over here. But Michael is definitely a guy that I, I would definitely want to have back on the show and wrap with some more because I feel like we just started to explore this territory and, uh, in one episode. And I, and I think there's a whole lot more mind jamming to go, you know, to go with and, you know, break out your, break out your mind flute and I'll break out my mind drums and we'll just lay down some riffs and see what happens. So that's kind of what this conversation is. And what we, you know, we wound up, we wound up talking about, I guess, a lot of things that were at top of mind for me and him as well. And what he talks about on the show. So go check out future fossils. You can find it everywhere. Podcasts are found. Links will be in the show notes in the description. And, um, what else? Yeah. Thanks to everybody who supports the show, man, ratings and reviews have been coming in like crazy. So keep it up. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's tremendous. Thank you to everybody that uh, takes the time to go into your Apple podcast app and find Mike Adelic and subscribe to it and give it a listen. And 
you know, if you really enjoy it, click a five star review or a five star rating. If you really want to go a step further, writing a review that always makes me smile, always makes me feel more connected to you guys. Reach out to me. I've been getting a lot of messages, emails on on my uh, website, mikebrank.com, m i k e b r a n c dot com. Contact page on there is right to my email. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I've been even, uh, looking at like sponsorship opportunities and stuff with some, some companies that I feel like are really, that I really just love. Cause I don't want to just promote anything. I think earlier on the show, you know, I got a couple opportunities for some sponsorships and they were pretty good, but I'm kind of moving away from them now. I just feel like they're not really serving me. I'm not aligned with them. I'm not, I don't really believe in them anymore as much as I used to. Uh, but that happens, you know, sometimes you get involved with something, you use something, you like something until something new comes along. So I'm exploring that. Uh, but I would like to try and keep the show as, as much as, um, as, you know, as Charles Eisenstein says, embodied in a gift mentality as possible. Uh, so I would like to just try and keep it that way. So if you like the show, if you like what you're hearing, go on to Patreon and show your support, donate a dollar, two, three, four, five, whatever you want per month. And I want to use that money to just make the show better, better resources, maybe even do video, get into a studio, do video conversations, um, make more, you know, it's, it's definitely it, the biggest help I think that, that it gets is to be able to ha- free myself up the time that it takes to do all the things and to edit everything because I do everything myself and really read and research and search for the people that are really tickling my neurons at this current time and start to having great conversations with them. So if you like that, if you like want more of that, uh, give a gift. Give a gift from from your heart to to donate to something that you like and that you believe in. And you can do that at patreon.com slash Mike Brank. And uh, if you don't want to do that, you can go on my website and you could do a one-time donation to PayPal. And you could do that as well. Um, so yeah, as this show grows and more people pick up uh, and, and listen to it, the best way that that happens is people tell other people about it. They like it. They share it. They share it on their social media. So I'm going to make – I want to start making more things that are going to be uh, – like titillating and stimulating and engaging that you that you really feel like compelled that you want to share that you want to spread uh you know this this little operation here is going to be uh, growing and expanding even more every every couple months every year it, it, it grows it gets bigger and bigger and i can't do it without your help your support your love your commitment and your 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 belief in the more beautiful world that our heart knows is possible, as uh, Charles Eisenstein says, which is the current book that I'm reading right now. And um, really inspiring, really helping me connect a lot of dots and glue a lot of pieces together of, of a lot of ideas, a lot of disparate thoughts and philosophies and ideas that I've been wrestling with and, and going over. Uh, and man, that guy is amazing. So Charles, if you're like, if you're happen to, if you happen to be listening, you're fucking amazing. It was it was great to to meet him at the Patagonia store when he gave his talk about climate, a new story. Uh, so that guy's just thinking on a whole nother level, and um, I'm I'm excited to just keep learning from him. And as I learn from him, the show evolves, my thinking evolves, the conversations with guests evolve. So thank you to everybody for all your love and support, for all your kindness, your generosity, your donations, your care, and your kind words. If you see me around, if I'm, if you're in Denver and you see me around, come up to me, say hi. Uh, but also also always just find me, message me, Mikeadelic underscore podcast on Instagram, Mikeadelic on Facebook, Mike Brank, MikeBrank.com, Patreon.com slash Mike Brank. Okay, cool. Next thing I want to say is I'm really proud uh, of a podcast that I helped create uh, from an author that I became friends with. Uh, His name's Alan Gordon. He was on the show a couple shows ago, How to Master Your Mind, Control Your Thoughts, Get Rid of Negative Limiting Self-Beliefs and all this kind of stuff. He's really great. He's got a, a course on happiness that he does. He wrote a book, The Cycle of Mind, and everything that he does is is under that brand name, Cycle of Mind. So go check out his podcast. His podcast is great. His podcast is not like my podcast. His podcast is topic specific, short, you know, twenty two minutes or so an episode. Uh, but he'll do topics on like why we need compassion, or what's going on with the Amazon rainforest, or how to you know create a bigger reality for ourselves and and master the you know the the limiting beliefs and things like that that go on in our minds he's a great guy he's got a great voice he's got great information and so i highly recommend it and i'm proud to say that i i helped him go from having nothing uh no podcast to having a podcast uh that's getting uh, some good downloads right now and people are kind of uh saying that they like it and stuff so it makes me feel good because that's the number one thing that i like to do the most is help 
collaborate with other people, brainstorm, empower their creativity, and help them, you know, find their voice and find their talents because we all have it. We all have this. You know, it was amazing. I was actually I was at a party recently, and um, I don't know if you know pe- too many people really knew what I what I did and uh, did to do the show and things like that. But I just found myself randomly getting into some conversations that other people were initiating, where they were talking about you know, a lot of stuff that we talk about on this show and, you know, just feeling like, Hey, you know, I'm feeling like, you know, a little disconnected. Like I feel like our generation is just more concerned about, you know, things that one thing, getting the next thing and the next thing. And it's amazing, you know, it's amazing to to feel this that's going on in, in the, in our like collective consciousness or in the individual's minds that are, it's like, it's all, I feel like we're all kind of feeling this. We're all in this time right now of this transition, this change and all these kinds of thoughts that are emerging that maybe we don't know where they're coming from. And we're starting to listen to them and explore them and not resist them and not think that we're crazy and not think that we have nowhere to go or nothing to say and nothing to do. And there's this insurmountable, you know, challenge that we're facing and there's no way that we can get past it. And there's no way that we can create a better world and create better agreements, but we can. And it just starts with, in my opinion, it starts with, you know, like at that party, the people that were coming up to me, opening up and talking and they initiated the conversation. I'm curious, what do you, what do you think? Let's go, let's explore and really have the confidence and the trust and the faith to, to open up and to share about, you know, I, I really don't like my job. You know, I don't really, I really don't know what I want to do or, you know, my parents want me to do this or like my boyfriend wants me to do that or whatever it is. Let's, let's, let's open it up and explore it. And I think that that, that's why I love doing this show. And that's why I love talking to people and meeting people. But the giving people the gift of uh, stepping into their power and being the creators that they that we all are, you know, the gifts that we all have to give, that some of the gifts that we have to give we haven't identified yet, or maybe that they're not necessarily monetarily valuable to the confines of the structure in which we find ourselves existing in. But there, there's there's ways, and those ways are only going to be explored by us really getting in touch with what's going on at our core level. And, uh, and not feeling like we're alone, that we can share, that we can talk about it, and that we're not crazy, you know, that we have, there's, that we, there's allies, we're all, we're, we're all in this together, and we're all allies out there. So Michael Garfield, he's a great ally, what a great guy to talk to, I hope you guys are going to enjoy this podcast, and if you do, you know what to do. So that's pretty much it for me, um, I have... Yeah, I have a couple other on deck. Probably do another solo cast. Let me know how what do you guys think about the solo cast. You know, I think sometimes, sometimes it, they come out in different tones. Sometimes they come out in different styles. And the last solo cast that I put out, I felt I don't know, maybe I was like a little somber or something. But um, yeah, message me, email me, contact me. Let me know. Hey, this is good. This isn't good. You know, can you talk about this more? Would you do you like? the kind of long thinking out loud, tangential, rambling stream of consciousness style? Or do you, would you prefer maybe more topic specific podcasts where I could just talk about one thing, maybe for like 45 minutes or an hour and then call it quits. The problem is once I start talking, I don't ever really want to stop. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited. I mean, there's just, I mean, I'm so grateful for uh, meeting Chris Ryan and and my friendship with him and and doing his show and him coming on mine and and uh, and just getting the the ability to hang out with him and and rap with him and 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 all the people that I have like Charles and and Daniel Pinchbeck and and Michael Garfield and just all the people that that come into my life through the podcast that we're able to, you know, have have mind jams together and and develop uh, friendships and collaborate and brainstorm and and reach out and support each other and, and help each other. It's a, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. So I'm feeling really, really good about it. And, um, yeah, eventually I'm going to start looking out for more support as the show grows, as more things happen. So anyway, enough, enough of that crap. Uh, let's get into this conversation with Michael Garfield. Hope you guys enjoy. Love you all. Thanks a lot. Psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. 
they open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject the authority. Authority is a lie. Or is it perception? Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the opportunity. The opportunity. The opportunity. You should see a red dot going off saying that I'm recording, right? Have you used Zencaster oh, before? Do, yes. Oh, cool. I have, yeah. Corey Allen uses it. Um, a couple other folks. I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think uh, Michael Phillip of Third Eye Drops uses it probably because Corey told him to. Um, yeah, there's a few cool. folks out there. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for making the time and joining me today. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I, so I guess uh, where, where I'll start is uh, I, I took notice of what you were doing, I think maybe several months ago, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. And uh, Future Fossils, wow, that's, a, that's an awesome name. Uh, yeah, what's this all about? I listened to a couple episodes, really, really, really liked what I was listening to, and uh, was like, I got to talk to this guy, because <laughs> there's definitely a lot to unwrap and unfold. Uh and uh, I figured we could just kind of mind jam out and uh, and talk about it all. Sure, man. I uh, it, it delights me. Although I mean, statistically, this should not come as a surprise, but it delights me to know that people are still discovering my stuff because I feel like uh, lately I feel like I've been sort of edging into an early retirement. Really, <laughs> like becoming a new dad and working on the first full time job I've ever had in my life. Uh, I got last year at 34, and so like a lot of, a lot of my like original avalanche of creative output is not running down the mountain the same way it used mm -hmm. to, and so yeah. But but then again, maybe it's better to uh, put out less and better, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely quality. Uh, over quantity, I think is is something that I subscribe to. Um, congrats on being a new dad, by the way. That's awesome. Wow, what a exciting adventure that must be. It is. I mean, I've been spending years uh, riffing on Eric Davis's remarks that we're re-entering an age of animism, mm -hmm. and uh, I have my own little private theater for that at home now with a baby girl who, like for whom the world is still totally enchanted and like may never be disenchanted, at least in the way that it was for us, you know, in that she's growing up in a world where like the machines talk to you and, and know things about you. And yeah, I, yeah, it'll just be, it'll be really interesting to watch uh, her grow up in a world that was very different from the world of my own childhood. And I don't know, it's, it's it's a it's a treat. Yeah, and it it so. sounds like a trip too. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Very very psychedelic. Which in by the way, um, you may have addressed this uh, on the show before, but the name of your podcast kind of reminds me of something my friend Norman Katz said about, or he likes to ask people uh, if they were a drug, what kind of drug they would be, and like what their effects would be on people. Awesome. <laughs> So I don't know. What about you? What do you think? What do you think your effects would be? My effects? Yes. Oh man! Wow! What a good question. Uh, uh, to shatter the illusion of the infinite fractalizations of reality that you're currently swimming in to bring you into even more chaotic uh, disruption. <laughs> so that Jesus, dude. <laughs> You gonna give me like some cab money after that? Or like... <laughs> no, there's no. You just leave and f figure it out. You know, it's just a mess. Yeah. It's like, would they let you out of prison? You're just like, uh, I got five bucks. Yeah. I guess I'll figure this out. Yeah. I mean, I would love to say like, you know, in uh, to inspire and enlighten and awaken. And I don't know. Maybe some of that is true, but a lot of the times it's like, 
yeah learning i'm like learning out loud so and and like rambling and ranting and something something comes out of that but it's not orderly it's very messy yeah mm-hmm. right on yeah um yeah and then yeah the name i don't know i just i was going through all these names and i'm like oh, man this sounds pretentious this doesn't sound this is like too clever like you know and uh it, when i saw your, your name and michael phillips names of your, of your shows i'm like oh man gold like that's just great you know and uh and so with mine i was like i was thinking about it and yeah i really i really kind of subscribe to the humphrey osmond definition of psychedelic which is you know mind manifesting and that's sort of what i like to keep as the core f- fundamental floor of the show really it's not necessarily i think a lot of people hear mycadelic and they just automatically go oh this is all about psychedelics and it's kind of not really so no you're manifesting mike yeah it's me manifesting yeah and 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 you if you're a michael i'm a michael where does anyone call you mike yeah yeah they do um i think it's it's mostly people who want to take me down a peg (laughs) yeah Yeah, i get i get i get that with mikey people call me mikey it's like man you're really taking me down a peg well it's the hebrew suffix el is like of god right so i I just whether or not it's a conscious thing i do think that uh you know using the diminutive form whatever that is is just a way of yeah if people call me mikey i'm like pretty much guaranteed not not to regard them as (laughs) Uh, valid, <laughs> valid humans. Because <laughs> I mean, generally, that you know, like using the diminutive without consent suggests that you have like small genitals. Oh man! Or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that there's that there's some sort of uh, self esteem issue that's going to cause relational problems. Right. I mean, it's like I really, frankly, I don't care. Like if if you were Obama, I'd be like, all right, whatever. But <laughs> I'd be like, yeah. really, Obama? Hey, uh, good show, Mikey. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I th- I've always gone by Mike. You know, my my legal name is Michael, but um, yeah, I always feel like uh, yeah, well, whatever. I, I went on like a Reddit thread one time that was like uh, Michaels, like United or something. And it was like it's just hilarious, like just this like kind of nonsensical discussion of of the name. Actually, uh, you know, this may be of interest to precisely two people. Yeah, but uh, I. I have this thing about, you know, when I meet another Michael at a party, I'll always ask them or I'll, I'll say something about, oh, an emanation of the archangelic archetype, yeah. which, you know, like, oh, you and I have uh, involved from the same hyperdimensional uh, entity. And I, without a single exception, every Michael I've ever met has been down with that. Yeah, which I, you know, I think I do think that maybe like the the Michael's United subreddit is like the the technological prequel to our eventual nanotech Voltron thing, where evolution and involution meet at this point where we're actually capable of, you know, assembling into a giant robot. Yeah, yeah, fighting, that sounds pretty good. Fighting the yeah. devil robot. You know, fighting the devil, ro- the, the devil robot Dave or the Davids. <laughs> uh, what would it be? Oh, uh, it would be uh, well, just like Lucifer. You know, all the Lucifers yeah. of the world would come together into a giant mechanical dragon. And our anyway, this is ridiculous. I do want to say, <laughs> I do want to say that uh, to future fossils, to the name future fossils, um, I I think I may have betrayed a little bit of my. Uh, my the privilege of my youth when coming up Mm. with that name because i just spoke to an older woman recently who strongly objected to it who insisted with a completely straight face that she found the name completely totally offensive and that i should absolutely change it and then we got into an interesting conversation about how we've lost our rites of passage and we don't have a rite of passage into eldership anymore and so we have this insane cult of youth and that I don't think that she should take it personally uh, because it's no more true of her than it is of me. Um, but at the same time, I was, you know, I guess, I mean, the, I, the point is that, that uh, it's like one of those Zen gardens where you can never see the whole thing at once. Um, mm. That there is always a position from which whatever you are doing is going to offend somebody. 
And, yeah. and I just, uh, you know, so as much as people seem to appreciate that name, I have to remember that not everybody is prepared to contemplate their insignificance in deep time. You know, mm. I was like, being a fossil is actually a luxury because like most of them are not most dead animals have never never make a fossil you know so right. really it's a compliment because it means that you you died in an especially rare and, and special way um so so her like point of contention with you was about not being able to sort of wrap her head around or accept her own mortality or something well, she, is that she is that wanted right? to remind me that the word fossil is used as a slur like you old fossil oh gotcha you know? and i was yeah. like well if that's the case like the logic didn't make any sense i was like if, like han solo right. in star wars he's like where'd you dig up this right, old fossil? right but yeah. he's a fossil now and I was like, but yeah, if you're a future yeah. fossil, it means you're not there yet. So right. you're good. You should be good. But, you know, whatever. I don't eat lunch with her anymore. <laughs> good. Yeah, that's that's one way yeah, to solve the problem. Bubble. Well, well, so, okay. Like, yeah, future, future fossils. I mean, that's where we're where we're headed okay i get it um what where are we right now how about that why, why don't we talk there i like what you were talking about the rites of passage and and that sounds good i talk about that sort of thing a lot um but i'm wondering from your point of view having done your show and you're a painter and a musician uh an artist in all capacities uh and you interview a lot of really intelligent wise people what have you sort of gathered from, I guess, like, where, where are we in our present moment in time right now? Uh, what, what the hell is happening? <laughs> is that, well, it's, I guess good. it's sort of like, I, you know, I, I think that, first of all, when, when, you, when you say right now, I think the most important piece of that is sort of the, depends on what your definition of it is, is. Uh, cause like how wide is the now or how deep is the now, you know, like, like how wide is yeah. how present you are, right. How deep or how long is, um, like literally the, the duration of time that you're taking into consideration, you know, like most people would say now, you know, it might, it might even include like yesterday and tomorrow, you know, but it definitely mm -hmm. now most people are not thinking about next year. You know, um, that's right. still like over there somewhere. And, I, you know, I, I was su surprised to learn that only supposedly one out of 50 people uh, actually visualize time geometrically. But it sounds to me like all of us still think about it that way, even if we're not actually like manipulating a kind of conceptual object in our imagination. That's like a landscape, you know, like for me, mm -hmm. the, the year is a ring. Mm -hmm you know, and like wherever I'm standing is the close end of the ring. And then six months ago or six months from now is the, on the opposite end of the ring, you know, and really it's a spiral or a helix, but anyway, so, it's, um, so like with that being said, like just warning, uh, drawing attention to the fact that that is a characteristic of, of our now, now is that we're realizing that the, we don't all mean the same things when we use the same words and like, <laughs> like that this is yeah. a big deal uh, in terms of, you know, the awakening planetary culture that we are, you know, starting to synthesize, starting to forge out of all of these more regional parochial uh, limited cultures. And, you know, in, in a, in some sense, what's happening now has been happening for like 500 years, right? It depends on, you know, how, how roughly you want to paint this because we've got uh, yeah. transoceanic trade opening up and the, you know, the, in, the uh, cross-cultural commerce has been going on for centuries. Um, but the, you know, there's a, there's a, a where they talk about like, when more of something becomes a different thing, when quantity becomes quality, like you keep adding grains of sand to the sand pile and eventually it creates an avalanche. And that's a, that's a, a qualitatively, not just a quantitatively different thing. It's behaving differently. And so 
you know, even though in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. what we're talking about going through as a species right now, people can definitely anchor that and say, oh, it's the same as it's always been. You know, like my grandmother, uh, who reminded me um, about it 10 years ago, that my concerns about raising a child were a lot like the concerns about people in the 50s and 60s, who were like a lot of her friends didn't have kids because they were convinced that we were all going to die from the bomb, you know? And so like, there's that Mm -hmm. piece of it, but Mm -hmm. then there's also the piece of it's easy for us to, because the only people we have to talk to are the people that are alive right now, you know? So as, as different as they may seem, Mm -hmm. the fact is that everybody alive right now has something in common that all of that we don't have with all the dead people, which is that we have been alive at some point in this enormous acceleration of uh, the uh, information flows and the, you know, the density and the complexity of uh, human experience in, and in, you know, in a particular sort of defined way that, you know, that is the case. In, in other ways, it's the case that like, probably, uh, you know, we, we aren't arguably, we're not processing any more in like, no more information is hitting the eye in 2019 than was hitting the eye 5,000 years ago. Right. But like the way that it, the way that it lands in us is absolutely different. Like the way that our cognitive resources are assigned to, to making sense of our environment is very different than it was. Wait, no, no more information is hitting us than it was. Well, okay. Five... So like my buddy, JF Martel, who's a co-host of weird studies, uh, he mm-hmm. and I got into this argument because I was saying, you know, there's these uh, haptic vests that they were uh, they were used in in the TV show Westworld. If you're if you if anyone yeah. saw that that where they they could tell where the the androids were, they would feel them in the vest. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and I read a, a really excellent science fiction story from a few years ago in the Project Hieroglyph compilation, in which that vest is used to give a politician a sort of prosthetic sense of the presence of the animals that are inhabiting this forest, that they're all like tagged. And so they can Mm -hmm. feel when a deer is approaching that kind of thing. And I was, I was making the case when I was on weird studies that, that we're coming up with richer and richer sensory interfaces to, Mm -hmm. to like hot patch all of these different kinds of data uh, into sense channels that we can interpret and understand. And that this is because, like, in some sense, we're having to process more information about our environment. But JF was saying the human organism is the same now than it was back then. And and so, again, this is one of these these issues where it's like, I think maybe the one thing that I can really, really say is that it's become increasingly obvious that when people are talking about things, it's happening on different scales. um, And that that we don't all mean the same thing and that, you know, we're, we're fumbling from, uh, in the broadest sense, we're fumbling from really uh, like a naive realism, like a a belief that there's a world out there and that we know what's going on with it Mm -hmm. to this sort of more plastic and, uh, mutable, uh, interpretation in which, uh, we had to go through this age of like, nothing means anything, you know, or like, you know, that these are, that there, there is no uh, ground truth. And politically, politically, right. this is like very popular right now, you know, right, like right, manipulating right. Uh, people because reality is just a performance, you know. Um, mm-hmm, but on mm-hmm. the other side of this, there's going to be something more like uh, more integrated where there's no ground truth, but there's like a net made out of different perspectives that hold one another in tension and they will hold you up. Like it's like a hammock, you know, (laughs) it's like, or like a, like a Buckminster Fuller dome, like how every piece of it is pushing Mm. on every other piece. And so, you know, this is anyway, this is my opinion that, that we're, we're, we're becoming aware of the fact that we are part, that we're participants in this collective activity of cognition that we weren't even aware was like happening until very recently, historically, um, that, that yeah. each, each culture 
is contributing to like the human perspective in the same way that uh, members of a, of a crowd might contribute their guesses to like how many beans are in the jar, you know? And like, none, yeah. that's actually a bad example because that suggests that there are a given number of beans out there when in reality, it's more like we're right. all agreeing to drive on the same side of the road. And the question of like whether reality is a given number of beans in a jar or it's closer to some sort of social construct uh, you know, this is the mess that it seems like we're all navigating. Yeah. Right but it, like we are the same organism. Uh, however, all of these new mediums in which we're getting information dispersed to us and all, you know, our environments are also changing as well. So isn't there some kind of uh, feedback loop that's occurring that's sort of like maybe informing us or even, you know, with the use of psychedelics and, uh, you know, the increase of technology and the kind of intersection between those two things and, you know, biohacking and flow and, you know, all this sort of kind of try like this, this, uh, this advancement of, of the species, this sort of like uh, will or desire to evolve, if you will, to a higher state of beingness or consciousness is, is being uh, manifest through all of these sort of externalizations of what's going on in our, inside of our organism. And then that's in turn kind of like coming back to us. So is it, is the organism advancing to adapt to handle all of the new stuff? And then will it like sort of go through like a, a hero's journey on like a collective level to sort of uh, evolve? Or is it just that we are this way and these things are coming at us and we're sort of piecing it together to try and create this web? Um, if that does, does that make sense of what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, if there is directionality, and I, yeah. I have been arguing for a long time long time that evolution does have a direction okay um but it's not a direction in the simple way of us thinking about you know higher organisms versus lower organisms or you know that like pokemon like you evolve into the next thing and it's like sitting there waiting for you to evolve into it i think like really uh there first of all evolution for sure is a uh at least <laughs> like as, as surely as I can say anything is about uh, dissipating energy. Mm. So uh, it, it, it works. It's like organisms are uh, the way I just heard this described. I really like formed streams, you know, that your anatomy, your metabolism is a physical response to energy moving through an environment from one state into a, from a higher state into a state of rest. And so like, as, as the, uh, the world becomes increasingly disordered, it generates order. So this is like, uh, basically all of our paradoxes and, and weird ironic twists. It seems like the world contains, uh, them all quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this notion that, uh, that, you know, we have these myths now, like a narrative myth, like the hero's journey takes us from point A to point B, you know, through this sort of, uh, predictable structure, that structure must actually not, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it's actually, uh, an emergent structure, mm. uh, rather than like an underlying structure. Yeah. But, but at any rate, the, the, you know, this, so we do have like life curves, right? Like to get into that, like uh, write a passage thing, mm -hmm. you know, we do have the, each organism develops and in that development, it, uh, it's, it's kind of more like ecological succession, you know, where like, first you just have a rock, like a new volcanic Island and then seeds blow on it and lichen grows. And then, you know, the lichen breaks up the rocks and makes soil and the seeds take root. And eventually you, you, you know, you go through a couple stages and you get like, a forest with a tree canopy and an understory and all this stuff. And that to me feels like the cultivation of wisdom. Whereas evolution is um, like what's going on inside the body while this is happening. Uh, like, you know, your, your, your neurons are 
learning and adapting in the way that they're ne they're networked to each other, right? So like an individual neur neuron is learning, but what is it learning? It's not learning toward any kind of specific outcome. It's just optimizing its uh, its routing. It's like network activity yeah. with the other neurons. And, and so, I, you know, I don't know, this is all kind of abstract, but um, like, if you think like the simplest way of thinking about it, I think is a river basin creates all of these forks, you know, like anytime you look at a fractal, like a tree branches the way that it does, because that's the best way to allocate resources and to gather resources. Right. You know, and so, you know, similarly, like evolution, the reason like the tree of life, uh, even though it's it's not as like linear in some ways as a tree, like there's there's more horizontal connections than we used to think. Um, more animals trading bits of their DNA with each other than seemed possible, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, there are. Um, it is generally tree like in that. You know, the we're it, pushing energy through the system. You get like niches, like it, every new organism creates new opportunities for other organisms. And so there's over time, the aggregate activity of evolution on earth is toward there being more kinds of creatures. Mm, yeah. Um, and, and so that's a, that's a direction, but it's every direction. Right. And then like within that, there's every possible direction within that. Like, you know, it's not just that animals get smarter. They also lose occasionally in like a really choice environment where your food just comes to you. Um, you'll lose your head because you don't need it anymore. You mm -hmm. know, like think about clams or sea squirts. These are animals that used to have a head, you know, and, and they found a, a way to position themselves in ocean currents such that they don't need to go after food. And oh, that turns wow. out to be a, a pretty excellent strategy, right? And yeah. so, like, um, you know, yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot in terms of the evolutionary opportunity afforded to us. Like, right. if, if we know that evolution in general goes every way it can, just like water goes everywhere it, you know, it can, um, with the exception that it all runs downhill. So, like, we're all running down this entropy gradient but uh, there's so many different ways to do it. And like one of the ways to do it is to embrace technology as a way of making things easier for yourself uh, cognitively, right? So just outsourcing everything. Um, the human brain is smaller, at least from what I read, and I can't remember who authored this, so it's unstable place to put your whole worldview, but um, look it up. I'm pretty sure the human brain case is smaller now than it was 50,000 years ago because of writing. Just like the jaw is smaller now than it was a thousand years ago because of the fork, you mm. know? And there are, you know, when we talk about there being a human being, what it's not really accurate. Like there's all of this epigenetic stuff in the relationship between the human being and its environment. I mean, between like the, the, the genome and the environment and like the, the, the myriad numbers of ways that that can be expressed. So like you would turn out to be a completely different person if we took you as a baby and dropped you like 300 years in the future or the past, like you wouldn't yeah. be the guy that you are, you know, because so little of you is determined by what's inside your body. It's, it's, it's about this, this uh, kind of thinking that occurs between the body and everything else. And so, uh, so at any rate, there is, you know, there's the people that are going to just chase this all the way down to like clam level and, <laughs> and are, you know, and they're going to, and really we are, they compared to, you know, that hypothetical 50,000 year old human being who yeah. didn't, who, who could only rely on what they were able to figure out from themselves or basically like what they'd heard from their grandmother. And, um, you know, and so they're not, uh, dependent on the infrastructure in the same way that we are, but they're also not as powerful as we are in other ways. So it's, it's a weird trade-off. Um, I wrote a, a piece about this uh, called The Future is Indistinguishable from Magic, uh, you mm. know, in which I was, cool. I was talking about how, like, you get to the, you get to, like, 
godhood. Like if you were to really follow this transhumanist idea um, into, you know, you can live forever on the server farms. It's like, well, one thing that server farms yeah. uh, can not do that you can is like survive a massive solar flare. You know, like it, it, there are, there are ways that, um, you know, probably more people would survive today, but fewer people per capita probably would survive an event like Yellowstone blowing. You know, because right. we don't know how to hunt for our own food <laughs> No, anymore. right. Yeah, no, we don't. I, and like getting back to the smaller brains and the small, like no need for a head. I mean, why, why we have our, you know, since the dawn of agriculture, we've had these large concentrations of, of food where we didn't have to go out and be hunter gatherers anymore. And now you could, you could literally just order Amazon prime and live in your apartment and never go out. So, it, you know, in a way it's not like, you know, how many people are actually actually actively directing the state of their evolution and then therefore contributing to the collective human evolution? You know what I mean? Like how, how many people are actually aware of, of what is, is going on or are they just kind of like, you know, tacitly going along and and every new innovation that comes out? You know, like I, I was talking to Charles Eisenstein recently and and he was, you know, we were talking about how um, – you know, it's great that we have these innovations and we have these things that come along and they can make our lives easier. Like, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? We're tool building creatures and we're supposed to be increasing leisure time and these sorts of things. However, we're sort of on this path now where we're like, okay, there's massive calamities and oil spills and disasters and ecological crises. But no, 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 don't worry, don't worry about it because we're just, we'll invent this thing. And it'll be like a dome city and we'll suck out all the carbon and, you know, this, all this stuff will be taken care of because we've just had these new innovations. So it's like, how many people I, I'm wondering, like, I guess, I mean, just guess, you know, uh, are, are actually uh, in the driver's seat or in the passenger seat? You know <laughs> None what I of mean? us are in the driver's seat. None <laughs> of us. None of us. Yeah. We all, we all, we're, we've all been in the back seat since we learned to speak. Yeah. I mean, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm of, I, I gave a presentation in February. I'll send you if you want to include it in the show. Yeah, notes, definitely. Um, where I, I, I talked about how um, basically it looks to me like, how would I put this? Okay, so we've, from the, the moment that we were able to achieve cumulative culture, you know, where it wasn't it, like the half-life was longer than two generations. And so we were actually able to build on the things that we inherited mm -hmm. on the, the, you know, the teachings and the understandings that, ha yeah. that we inherited. Um, that f functionally, that looks like at that point, the human community takes over as the center of cognitive activity and that all, all of us are just performing sort of local measurements that are contributing to that, that hive brain or whatever, mm. um, not technically a hive brain, but like it's, it's, you know, I feel like we went through a, uh, uh, what biologist Lynn Margulis called endosymbiosis, which is when mm. the one organism becomes a part of another organism and that something new is created. So like all of your cells in your body are this way. They're, they're functional, co uh, conglomerates of simpler forms of, of microbial life that have been living in obligate association with one another now for billions of years. You know, like, uh, so there's a sense in which I think something like that happened. It happened before history for human beings, but we're, we've been inside of this creature and d this bigger thing that actually, that doesn't have a simple kind of location like we're used to. Uh, it's what Timothy Morton would call a hyper object, like human civilization. We can't see all of it at once. So right. We don't think of it as a thing, as a single thing, but it is a single thing. It acts like one. Uh, you just have to be looking at it at the right, you know, le order of magnitude. And, mm -hmm. and so in that light, um, you know, going back to this question of, of, you know, the future of human evolution, it's, it seems like some people are going to, uh, that there's like a, a, all sorts of places you can get off this train. You know, there's like different yeah. depths within the yeah. different layers of dependency. And, um, Ooh, I and, like that and, different layers of dependency. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I mean, you know, like Stuart Brand, who uh, co-founded Long Now, uh, you know, he he's made a good point. Uh, Kevin Kelly has also made this point yeah. that that even if you go live in a cabin in the woods, you are still dependent on civilization. Yeah, that like that you know you like you know you you're going into the woods with like an axe and a flashlight, and you are incapable of reproducing either of those if yeah. you lose them right you know yeah. like that, that that we're we're already so deep in it we don't even realize it we're, we're just talking about like whether it's a good idea to descend from 2500 meters to 2600 meters mm. you know or whatever it's so but there's this other part which is which is that uh that we could and in some ways we do um, engineer these symbiotic relationships to in to to encourage the the human as a cognitive actor right you know um, yeah so like there's like nick nick carr gives a great example i bring this up on the show a lot uh nicholas carr talks about turn by turn map instructions mm-hmm. and how relying on google to tell you how to get around um actually weakens the uh the the network of cells in your brain that determines your geospatial orientation Mm. upon which all of your memory is based. Like if you go, if you track the brain back through evolutionary time, we learn to remember things by storing them as like uh, metadata on top of our geographic memory, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know? So it's like, you know, that's why it's so much easier to remember the last time you were at a place when you're there. You right. know, because it's like yeah. it's called up. Um, and so this uh Nick Carr interviewed this neuroscientist who said that, you know, basically we're probably looking at early onset Alzheimer's for like an entire generation of people who oh my God. who, you know, I mean and who knows, right? But then there's another sense um where we're not we're not putting you know, like I, I think we're we're just now getting to the point where we realize that some of these fantasies of technological empowerment are in yeah. fact possible because they don't um, erode fundamental human functions. Right. You know, right. like like you can uh, use these things to improve your memory, to improve your ability to free associate, to improve your ability to find collaborators who can contribute to your thinking in meaningful ways. You know, video games were the other example he gave and like video games where there's no manual and it just drops you in and you have to figure it out, you know? And I think that, that, uh, these are really kind of like two personality types, mm-hmm. uh, in a sense, like the, the, the ones who are just like, just give it to me easy. Right. And then the ones that, that really want to develop themselves and, and better themselves. And obviously that's each of us sometimes, you know, like each of us has both of those sometimes, but I think that, uh, and I, you know, and, and, and it's going to depend on the scenario, you know? So, I mean, long, long story short, I, I kind of imagine that we're going to end up in this sort of high dimensional, uh, grid of, of everyone being like, all right, this is the part of my brain I'm going to allow to, I'm going to like feed the machine. And this is the mm-hmm. this is what I want back from the from this experience. Oh wow! And so yeah. you're going to end up with this like enormous diversification of the kinds of not just artificial intelligence, but uh, organic intelligence. Like you know, people like neurodiversity in the workplace was that were people talking about that ten years ago? Because I don't remember them talking about that ten years ago. And now it's a no. big thing. You yeah. know, now it's like recognized that it's a value to the organization, which is you know, a creature. It's like a, it's a, right. it's a super organism that you're participating in. And it's better for that, that thing to have multiple points of view, you know? So it's like you and your coworker that disagree with each other are actually, well, that's sorry, but that's useful at the level of, of the, the cognitive functioning of your company, you know, right. it's like, it needs so stereoscopic yeah. vision. So I don't know. It's just, yeah. yeah. It's just, it's, it's creepy to think about, um, you know, a lot of this stuff gets kind of Lovecraftian, you know, when you, mm. you realize that you, that your entire life, you've just been like participating in this giant invisible monster. Um. <laughs> I I mean, I, I've, I feel that way. I mean, even today I just had the thought of like, 
man, I just, I don't feel like at home in this world right now, you know, in, in this, in that particular moment, I was feeling that, you know, it was a, it was a, a moment of maybe like 20 minutes or something this morning where I was just like, you know, looking out at, at the city and knowing what I had to do for the day. And I was just like, I, I feel so, uh, estranged from the activities that I need to participate in for the day today I feel so detached from uh, this sort of like organic beingness and the humanness of the activities and the and even the environment in which I'm in I just had this moment of like detachment and just feeling sort of isolated for 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 a brief moment and that's always been, I mean that that's been a theme sort of in my life uh, this this sort of like you know this sort of primal or these this this sort of primal sort of uh, feeling that I, I want to be sort of in living in the world uh, and and a part of it in the, in the natural sort of way whatever that means and then looking out at the sort of landscape in which I'm in and being like okay this feels weird almost matrix level kind of like I just popped out of the tube <laughs> what the hell is this you know I, and it's 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 not these aren't constants it's just sort of something that that comes up in moments so why do you feel alienated i find this to be like a really interesting uh like i, f- I feel like this is the the tragedy of of our, like the modern condition or something but i want to hear yeah i think i think it is there it just I think, you know, we want, there's this sort of, it's, it, there's this overarching authoritarian order that has been sort of like thrust upon us that we're just birthed into. It's like laws and, you know, cities and infrastructure and it's all just there. Right. And so it's like, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it communes. I don't commune with it. It doesn't feel at home to me. It, it, it doesn't feel warm. It doesn't feel inviting. It feels cold. It feels distant, detached. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, there's, I think that there's a lot of things that I just feel innately that I, I want to be a part of and I want to do, and I have opportunities to do that. If I go camping, I go hiking. If I, you know, I spent some time living in the Amazon rainforest, that was great for a little a period of time, but it's also, I didn't, I also didn't want to live there for the rest of my life. I wanted to be back in the world and have iPhones and social media, but not too much social media, not too many, not, you know, not looking at the screen too much. It's this, you know, it's almost like, I feel like I've, it's trying to figure out mm-hmm. how to ride the bicycle. It's like having a balance of, you know, social media could be great. Instagram could be great. You know, what we're doing right now, this is great. This technology is great. But at the same time, there is also this sort of understanding of how to balance the whole thing out in order to feed my, like you were saying, feed the machine and then feed the human, you know, it's like, I don't want to be a servant of the mechanism of society and culture. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a participant in it, but I want to do it in a, in a way that's, that's whole and, um, yeah. Yeah. And like reciprocal. Yeah. You know? I mean, you know, I think a big piece of this is that, you know, I've been, I've been reading a lot in the last year about the limits <laughs> of the human being, you know, what, what the limits, what they really are. Mm, yeah. Um, there is, or at least, you know, what, to the best of our understanding, we, we have identified them to be, you know, that one of the things that I found kind of interesting is that, um, I was just reading today about the, this, uh, social, social scientist, uh, Mirta Galasic at the Santa Fe Institute, who has done some work on, uh, like political polling and uh, social learning and, and uh, social estimates, you know? So like part of it is that, uh, you know, why, why are committees usually small? You know, why, why, if we're going to come up with like a political action group or a, like a jury or whatever, why is it usually, you know, juries are like five to 12 people, Polit- you know, c- political committees are like 30 or 40 people. Uh, we have the ability to coordinate at much greater scale now. So why don't we do that? And it, it turns out that our uh, ability to offer uh, useful like uh, group estimates on something or predictions actually goes down uh, once like above a certain point, like, you know, if it, it has to do with too many cooks in the kitchen, the, well, it's, 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 it's about, 
if it's something that experts could see easily, then you can keep scaling people up kind of indefinitely and it's not going to harm your prediction ability, but it is going to cost more to coordinate all of those people. Whereas if it's the kind of thing that, so like, you know, above, you know, uh, however many, a few dozen people, you're not going to get a better answer by adding Mm. more experts. But if it's something that the experts have trouble predicting and you're just drawing people from the population kind of randomly, um, which, you know, given the complexity of, of contemporary yeah. issues anyway, it's like you can think that you put all these experts in the room and like some weird orthogonal thing is going to turn out to be the thing nobody saw. So like if it's if it's something that people have in general have a hard time predicting, then the more people you add, the worse the prediction is going to get above that number. So like there's, so basically what there's, you know, this, that's like one peg in this, this circus tent of all of the reasons why we can't actually operate uh, at scale the way that we have sort of created the opportunity to try and operate at scale. You know, like I I think about this with, um, uh, there was another an, uh, you know, another piece, uh, uh, Albert Cow, who's another SFI uh, researcher, found, and this is just like basic stuff. This isn't about what you believe. This isn't about how smart you are. Uh, this is, this isn't even about whether or not you're human. This is just about how networks work and how information works in networks. That he found that the longer um, the memory of the individual nodes in a network, so like the longer the memory of you know, let's just say, you know, leaders in a community or whatever that are coming together to make decisions. Um, the the more trouble that network had updating itself to new information, and the, like, <laughs> so there's like, you know, t- city council has like the one stubborn old yeah. guy that just insists on doing yeah. things his way, and so like the longer the the cultural half life. Um, the more inflexible the collective cognition of that group is. So at the level of a society, um, you actually don't want people living for like thousands of years and creating a uh, a gerontocracy. Mm. You know, like I keep thinking about this, you know, to get back to our, our uh, bits about yeah. rites of passage. It's like my, my buddy, Kevin Walmut, was commenting on uh, something today. I read that he was talking about, you know, that the without a rite of passage into becoming an elder, then the oldest people with the most wealth, opportunity, etc., are basically acting as obstacle incumbents mm. because they're not willing to step down from a position of power and advise people. You know, and that this is one of these ways, it's like a chair with a back. It's like, okay, so we've created this additional structure in society that's actually making us weaker as a whole on the whole, because you know, but we think we're doing ourselves the right thing. Like we've got it all backwards. It's like we think it's a great idea to have a bunch of 70-year-old politicians because they've seen yeah. the world. And it's like, no, it's not. It's like you <laughs> really at some point, and I mean maybe that age changes over time, you know, as as things in the, within the culture change. But you know, as a millennial, I'm more than happy to go on record saying like, when, when do I get to afford a house? You know, like when does, when does the tree come Mm -hmm. down in the woods and like shed a little light on the forest floor for God's sake, you know? And, and so in that sense, you know, I do, yeah, I don't know. I just think a lot about, um, you know, like the, with like the Dunbar number, you know, about that. Yeah, like you just can't care about seven billion right, people. You right, can't. Right. You yeah. can't. You can't do yeah. it. You know, and it, and, and it doesn't. It, fr- it doesn't make sense for you to, uh, for each of us to try and and weigh in on what the best thing to do about the Amazon burning is, because like most of us don't have any friggin' Yeah, clue. it's like it's so overwhelming, yeah. and it's and it becomes these sort of like virtual abstractions, just something that you see on Twitter or you hear about or read on Dig or whatever it is, and like it's just like, oh man, this is crazy. All right, on to the next thing. Holy shit, did you see what this new SNL cast member said? Oh man, trending on Twitter. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, but like what about the fact that the United States might fucking invade Iran, you know, 
because of like some shit that's going on over there. Or yeah, like the Amazon is burning on fire. Like there's all this stuff. And it's just like, what? Yeah, we can't possibly, it's almost like this overwhelming kind of irreverence that's just like, okay, yeah, I guess like whatever, it doesn't really matter. Like the only thing that matters is right in front of me, you know, and then you see it with, you know, being reflected in all the kind of self-help uh, stuff coming, you know, like, fuck, fuck it, fuck everybody else. Just like hustle and grind, work on yourself, you know, F- forget the outside, let the outside world burn. It doesn't matter. Like just take care of yourself because it is weird. It's like, we can't, we don't see it. There's no, like the mere proximity effect of what is happening is not around us. It's like in a, in this other world over there in this virtual space that just kind of is on a screen. I think for a lot of, well, a lot yeah. of you know, well, or we're made to believe that it's relevant to us. Mm. You know, but, but in, and, and it's, 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 it's complicated, right? Because uh, here's another Mirta Galasic paper was on how uh, if most people are worse off in general, you know, let's say uh, income, right? Like if most people don't make that much money, then if you make a lot of money, you're going to assume that most people are make more money than they do because you're surrounding yourself with people like you. Yeah. We all do it. Right. You know, and, and, and it's kind of hard not to do it. It takes effort to even in, even in this time when it's like, all you got to do is take five seconds to log into a Nazi subreddit or whatever, you know, it's like, it still takes effort to find people that are radically different from yourself and offering up a different worldview to the, the planet brain or whatever. Um, it, it's the case that like, basically if, if, most people are about as, you know, are worse off generally than if you are poor in that dimension, uh, in the, on that axis, then you're actually, you've got a more accurate, you're more likely to give a more accurate measure of the community. But in either case, you're still not actually giving an accurate measure of anything other than the people around you, mm-hmm. you know? And, and her paper made an interesting point, which was, that it's actually adaptive not to be able to try and make to, to to like not waste brain resources on trying to understand what life is like for everyone in the world. Yeah. You know, that like we really just do not have <laughs> we're not built that <laughs> like, way, yeah. We're not we're not made for that. Right. You know, we're we're made we're made for being able to uh compare ourselves to the people that we're capable of remembering and tracking. Right. And so what that, what that does is it ends up, you know, you end up with at at the scale that we're at, then it's made much worse actually, because the people who do not have power are ever more keenly aware of the fact that we don't have power and there's nothing we can do about it. And it creates this horrible cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And it's in a way, maybe this is like a historical pressure valve and you know, it'll lead to like something in the spirit of like global labor unions and there will be a massive planet wide human rights revolution or something um, at some point. Like it's got to get really bad first. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I see that <laughs> happening. I think I see I see us like adapting into the blob of the civilizational oppressive you know regime like like the 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 ideological sort of uh, uh framework in which we're all sort of operating in where it's just like it seems like to me you know that it's like this this sort of very yeah, everything's fine. Just like, don't worry about it. You know, do what you can. And, uh, you know, as long as you have your, you're, you're making good money, you know, you just kind of, you stay in your bubbles. And, we'll, and as we're creating these, uh, you know, relative reality bubbles, we're all sort of go- just going to kind of like merge into that. And then this, this overarching kind of like outside blob is just going to hold all those bubbles into place and they're going to do whatever the fuck they want to do because that's what they've been doing and that or that's but they're going to crash into each other right because like you can't yeah you can't you can't screen homeless people out of your augmented reality (laughs) urban utopia without them just like beating your beating your ass up right yeah maybe yeah and and that's the that's that's why i love uh was it nick hanover the billionaire who wrote that piece about how they're all they're coming for us with pitchforks you know, because he's like, you guys, you're only comparing yourselves to other billionaires. Like, you, you don't have a sense for the fact, like, just how 
serious an issue this is. Yeah. You know, and like the more uh, rapidly bids are made on our attention, the more information we're kind of required to expose ourselves to. I think that's ultimately the difference. You know, it's like the same human being now, but socially relevant information has gone exponential. Yeah. You know, so like you were talking about like the SNL shit, it's like the amount of cultural ephemera that it seems like we have to keep up with in order to play the game of humanity is, yeah. is, is absurd. And, and, and it's absolutely fair to just say no to that. It'd be like, no, fuck that. But, but uh, it's also easy for us to get caught up in it. And the more bids that are made on our attention, um, the harder it becomes to notice something that would otherwise have been easier if you were only sampling the world at, you know, every minute instead of every like half a second. And then at some point, this is like, you know, high frequency trading algorithms. At some point it gets so fast that we can't keep up with it. And then things start happening in the market that nobody understands. And like you get a flash crash in 2010 that people are still analyzing, you know, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it just, so at any rate, I do think, I think that at some point the house of cards has to come down for everybody. Um, But you know, when it collapses, what level will it collapse to? You know, like I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that believes that you can just take the first, like the top few floor of the building, few floors and like knock them out and it'll just neatly collapse everything beneath it. You know, like maybe, right. <laughs> maybe, yeah. you know, <laughs> this, this whole thing falls down and we're back to like 1850 with, you know, we we repair smartphones before we try to buy a new one or whatever, you know, and like there's like big parts of the global supply chain fall apart, but we're not where we were back then, right? We've made all of these advancements. And so I don't know, it's just the whole thing is exceedingly nonlinear. And I'm, I'm yeah. super uh, frustrated on a daily basis with people who think that the future is going to be one way or the other when it's clearly mm-hmm. part of this, this, uh, fractal river basin of of simultaneous and and co-occurring outcomes that are very different you know so yeah. cavemen yeah. and space people yes <laughs> you know absolutely of, of course Bro. of course as soon as we can you know genetically engineer ourselves people are going to be like screw this i'm going to be a gorilla i'm yeah. you know no language for me thanks you know um Wow, and like uh, was it Greg Benford talked about that in in his book, um, um, it was his manifold trilogy, where you know it's like some some of the human beings like voluntarily un, undo civilization, and then the rest of us, you know, like some of us will upload ourselves into machines, and you know some of us will explore what it's like to be an octopus, you know, and it's just like you know. I, to me, it just seems like there's just more going on the further we go, you know? Right. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, but you, you, you brought up something uh, really interesting there where you're referencing uh, the guy, the bi- paper about the billionaires and the people coming with pitchforks. Mm. What do you, what do you think? Um, like, what do you think is like the, the average person's like, m- you know, discontent, like their most, their most, you know, feverish, like, uh, anguish that is that that maybe is going on you know in relation like them in relation to us in relation to the thing in which we're participating in civilization reality whatever like where do you think that like friction comes from or that you know what 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 is the thing that's like that people are contemplating picking up a pitchfork and like running down to like you know exxon corporate headquarters and you know just like pitchforking the ceo and throwing a trident through his head like what what's that what do you think is like what's the if you could put your finger on the pulse of like what that is like what would your guess be in in terms of where that kind of like is coming from in 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 the individuals well i mean or maybe even for yourself i don't know if you you feel that way well i mean if i haven't tipped my hand in this conversation already <laughs> you know i am i am eagerly awaiting a a vast redistribution of power and wealth <laughs> i okay. am yeah. you know i am i am very i'm going to be very happy if i live to see that um right but uh at the same time i'm not really sure 
what, if anything, that would look like, you know, because part of this is uh, the way that the scale of civilization now creates these massive inequalities, you know, and it just, it just is the case that uh, this, the economic system that we have is set up like a pyramid scheme because if you make an early gain, then you're capable of taking greater risks. You're, you're capable of diversifying into more opportunities. And there's a whole uh, domain of, of non-equilibrium economics based on increasing returns, you know, uh, based on uh, your value being a demand side determinant or is determined by demand rather than supply. You know, which is why, uh, for example, like Kevin Kelly called this in his book, um, New Rules for the New Economy in the 90s, he, he, when he foresaw the way that um, mobile devices would become this, this like gated garden neighborhood thing for uh, like a walled, yeah, walled garden for uh, app developers. And so if you're early to market with a platform then you're the island that everything is growing on and you know like so yeah. you know itunes and this has always been the case right it's like whoever owns the, the printing press is making more than the author right whoever owns mm -hmm. itunes is making more than the musicians are making and uh and so without there being some way for these things to die um then that, you know, with that, there aren't forest fires, at least in the way that we conventionally think about them. There are, there are like economic depressions, um, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. unless they're bad enough to actually kill these companies, then the companies actually are able to consolidate and buy up, you know, their bankrupt, bankrupt competition. And uh, the fire just didn't burn hot enough to knock out the incumbents, you know? So, I mean, mm -hmm. I, this is all roundabout, but like, I, I think that basically what people are upset about is knowing that there are people out there that wipe their ass with more money than someone else is making in a year. And like, yeah. and oh, by the way, that person doesn't even have access to a clean toilet, you know? And obviously that ain't right. You know, and to put it in a more like a, a first world kind of a way, um, even though these are increasingly looking like first world problems as well, uh, you know, your point about alienation, you know, there's something this, this whole conversation around human scale architecture, you know, that that mm -hmm. you go into a city and it's inspiring and energizing, you know, to 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 step foot in Manhattan. Yeah. But at the same time, it is. Yeah. This kind of oppressive reminder that you do not matter, you know? And uh, one of right. my favorite talks by William Irwin Thompson, uh, the historian, he was talking about um, the circus in the writing of Charles Dickens and how the circus has, has always survived through history, even as we've become more and more civilized and our civilization has, has, become harder and harder for us to understand and feel purpose purposefully a part of that the circus has maintained this place where it's about the mastery of the human animal and it's human scale challenges like the trapeze or, or juggling, you know, these are things that we are capable of mastering, you know, lion taming, we're capable of having this encounter uh, where, you know, we, we radiate power and rise to the occasion and that kind of thing is extremely hard to find in uh, a life that started with public school and then proceeded on to institutional work and then ended in, you know, a, uh, an industrial right, yeah. funeral. Yeah. Oh, you know? God. And it's like, yeah. at what point did you actually get to be a human being? Yeah. And I think, I think ultimately that's, that really is the, 
I think that's what you're asking. Totally. Like, I think so too. I think, you yeah. Know, like stop hogging all the fun so that I can be a human too. Well, right. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, yeah, this, this, this mechanistic model of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of assembly line of human beingness in production, you know, like you go to grade school, you go to there, you do this. And it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to step out of that sometimes. It's hard to have the awareness that there even is an outside of that when you're in it. You know, but it's like, you know, you're, you're yeah, totally. And, and, and I, and I feel like, uh, who said that, um, uh, what Henry David Thoreau, uh, was talking about, you know, these, this, this feeling of like quiet desperation, you know, it's like this, this, this alienation, this separation, there's something that is quietly sort of eating at you where you're like, not really sure where you can pinpoint the, the anger on, but is this, this industrialized, you know, indoctrination brainwashing system, uh, that, that, that just, yeah. The, the, where, where, where are you allowed to be alive in that? Where are you allowed to have a uh, real human communion and, and, and things it's, it seems to be, that seems to be what the sort of vice that is tightening on, mm-hmm. on people. In my opinion, I, I agree but, with you. I mean, yeah. at the same time, you know, there, again, like there are a lot of people for whom this is not a problem. And I think it's, it's at least worth yeah. it to like honor the, uh, you know, that species of human that does not feel at home anywhere, but in the, you know, the dense urban core um, that, you know, that is more than happy to just jump into the singularity head first and, and allow whatever doesn't, you know, matter to the great algorithm in the sky to be paired away. Um, and yeah. you know, and it's just, I, I, there's, there's another sense in which really that's all any of us can ask for. Uh, and then just some of us are more comfortable with the wilderness that human beings have created versus the wilderness that created human beings, you know, that, Mm. that, uh, like, I think like Dan Simmons Hyperion books in which humankind sort of accidentally create a deity through our organic collective. And then that we, and then we intentionally create a machine deity. And then those two deities discover each other and, and have like a clash of the Titans. You know, like that's, wow. I kind of feel like that's what's going on right now. And that we're all just sort of dancing underneath the, the feet of these things that are, that are, um, you know, that history is, is a, a, like a clash of the Titans kind of a, a thing. It's again, it's not, it's not, a, I mean, we, we tell our stories about history as though it's about, you know, great men and great women doing great things. And it's like, no, that's just the only part that we can comprehend you know, and, and in reality, right. this is like, like, I, I think about memes, like, what is it? What is a meme physically? You know, like, if you could identify the pattern, if you could see from orbit, the pattern of electrical firing in the brain, that's like, oh, that's someone having being a Christian. And then you could like watch as those nodes, those like that, that web of people all over the world does things, you know, then it's like, there is a sense in which that idea is this like decentralized organism that is solving puzzles like a slime mold or something. And it's having an effect like, like Batman in, in some sense is more real than any of us. Cause there's just more Batman stuff and there's mm. more people thinking about Batman, Batman as like a, a vector that causes things to happen in the world is going to be a, you know, a coherent thing for much longer than any of us, you know? And so, you know, why, why isn't history written by, in, in a weird way, this turns the whole thing on its head, right? It, it, it makes uh, fictions in some sense more real than what we think of as, as non-fictions. But um, yeah, I, that's where I want to go. Yeah, no, so, I mean, no, <laughs> totally. I, I, I see that, you know, and, and it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I was talking about this, I talked about this on the show like a little while ago about how like Santa Claus, you know, same kind of thing. It's like, you know, it's not that it's fake, you know, it's not that it's real, but in a way 
it's sort of Israel, and it's it's sort of what you're saying with with Batman. I mean, we've we've invented this whole culture around Santa Claus and gift giving and the mythology of it, and you know the presents and the dress up and everything. And so, what? Where is the fake? Where is the real? What what does it matter? You know, it's I think, you know, but we're comfortable in that realm. We're comfortable in that sort of invented realm for whatever particular reason, but then we have a harder time following that logical consistency with, with other things, you know, mm-hmm. um, which, which is very frustrating to me. You know, I, 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 I hate, I hate this aspect of myself that I allow myself to get frustrated by like, Oh, why don't, how come people, you know, I'll put out something. I'll be like, man, this is a really good conversation. Oh my God. Only like 2000 people. And then, then there's like, 50 million views on some, you know, someone kicking a cat in the balls or something. It's like, why, why is that? What is it? It's, it's almost like, you know, I, I like to have this and I'm a part of, you know, my community, my people, my friends, like everyone is very like, you know, love and light and, you know, peace and then, you know, harmony. And I'm like, yeah, I totally, I'm down with it. I dig it. I'm, you know, all that stuff. But there's also a part of me that is like, I, I think humanity is just, we're fucked. Like people are fucking idiots and I hate them. And I was like, you know, that's like a thought that pops into my head and I'm like, all right, you know, like this is just a feeling that I'm having right now, but there is a part of me that friends, not the ones I know. (laughs) Yeah. No. Oh, for, yeah, no, me, the one, the ones that I know, they seem to, they're active, they're engaged, they're doing stuff in the community. They're, they're putting things together. They're critical thinkers. And, you know, that's great. But outside of that, outside of that, you know, look, look at the ma- the masses, you know, is what I'm what I'm saying is. And why do why do I allow myself to get frustrated by the, the sways of the masses? You know, especially when you are the masses, I am like, the masses. We that, are the masses. Yeah, yeah. You're just you're that same asshole from someone else's <laughs> point of view. Which is, you, you realize that the oldest joke known to I know, the, the I know. Joke in the world is a fart joke, right? Yeah. Like that, that this whole thing about like I you know I I actually I actually feel good about this sort of just knowing that it's the vast majority of work produced in any genre is just crap. Mm-hmm. You know, that these follow distributions where, you know, it's like anything else. It's like you know that most acorns are going to get eaten and that like very few things make it to being an oak right? It's it's just like that everywhere. And it's not, it's not like things are like, it's not like we're going to get more oaky as we become more civilized. It's like, no, pop will still be pop because pop is, is what sinks its hooks into the deepest and most generic parts of us. You know, it's the things that appeal to us before we can even talk. You know, the, the, the rhythm, the color of, of music is, you know, it's like, it takes, it takes some time. Like my infant daughter for the first few months cried every time we turned on the jazz station, because it's like, you think about how narrow her time frame is, how small her now is. It's like, she can't wait for a chord to resolve. It's just unpleasant, <laughs> you know. She can't wait for a chord to resolve. I mean, it's just, she's, yeah. she's just not thinking about what's going to happen. Right? Yeah, she doesn't have the capacity for right. that. Yeah and, yeah, and so you know, it's natural that you would think, oh, you know, a five-hour n- opera has to be an acquired taste because you have to like be willing to sit there and do that, which implies that you have the free time to do that, the free time to like even cultivate that kind of aesthetic. And so, you know, really, I have no hope that all of us are going to become, I mean, here's another one for you. Um, And although this is sort of a little bit more oblique uh, and and crude, um, when you're you're a ball of cells, (laughs) when you are first developing, uh, before your parents even know that you exist, you are... At some point, you got to make the decision to form a little pouch. That pouch is going to go all the way through and become your guts. And for most invertebrates, like all all insects and arachnids and crustaceans and so on, um, the first thing that the little pooch is the mouth. You know, like from from ball to bowl, you get the mouth first. For starfish, sea cucumbers urchins and everything with a spine it's the anus first 
And so oh, yeah. you start it out, you start out an asshole. <laughs> and then like, if you're lucky, you grow out of it. Right. Like all of us, yeah. uh, Ken Wilber yeah. was fond of saying this. You start at Everyone starts at square one. So like, actually what happens is like over time, as we become more and more civilized, the bar keeps getting higher, you know, like, like right. if you like my buddy who's a, a Mitch Mignano who uh, has been on my show and is a, a, a historian who studied under Bill Thompson, he was like got me into Game of Thrones precisely because it was in some respects not fantasy. In some respects, it's an accurate historical telling of like the archaeology of medieval consciousness and like how people used to think as adults, and like that looks like high school now. And if we're lucky, in another few hundred years. What co- what constitutes adulthood will be like something that you're tested on in in school and like you have to pass in order to obtain political office, you know, like there's just mm-hmm. obviously we live in a world that's where, you know, when we think, oh, my God, I can't believe this person is in charge. We're thinking it's so a thousand years ago. Right. But then there's like this other piece of it, which is uh, Robert Keegan has this fabulous book in over our heads, the mental demands of modern life, where he Mm -hmm. says, like, basically, it just it gets harder and harder for each of us to make it to adulthood. As you know, as this continues, that like what it means to be an adult now is so much more than what it meant to be an adult 100 years ago. It's insane. It's no wonder that so few of us actually make it. That we're like, so, so many of us are like stuck mm. in this weird adult adolescent bullshit, you know, because they're, because we, right, haven't, yeah. we haven't had time I feel that way. to like yeah. put the systems in place to help. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't like made the cultural conveyor belt yet for this stuff. We're just figuring out now what it is, you know, what, what, it, what does it even mean to be an adult now? You know? So that's, that's the rant. Yeah. Wow. What does it, what does it mean to be an adult for you, Michael Garfield? And, uh, yeah, I, li- I want to know a little bit about what's going on in your life right now, and uh, uh, some any projects you have. I know you're, you're always posting artwork and, and music, so yeah. maybe we could talk um, a little bit about some of that. I continue to produce music. I produce almost everything um, on uh, a guitar and a voice and hardware effects, improvised live. Um, I mean, I think about it. All of these ideas that I've been having over this call have gone into the way that I think about music as this, this uh, kind of evolutionary process. And to perform music is about creating a, mm-hmm. a kind of cognitive ecosystem in which I'm just part of something that also includes the agency of the equipment that I'm using, of the room that I'm in, of the people that I'm playing to or playing with. And so it's it's sort of a um, even though I'm using the basic elements of like a folk singer songwriter, uh, I'm moving it into a space that is like distinctly post-human and uh, in, in the literary sense of like critiquing the boundaries that we've drawn around the human being. And um, so I, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. I I have been doing that uh, in the U S I got to play boom festival in Portugal a few years ago. Uh, I got to I, I got to tour Australian festival circuit awesome. with with this in 2017, and um, you know work with all sorts of painters or you know uh, dancers and software, um, you know really just stretching that into a, uh, a just sort of joyous playful activity, and I'm keeping that alive here. Um, I mean, is that what you love to do the most? If it were, then I'm uh, I'm uh, shitty to myself because I'm <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing it uh, as much of that as as I would like. Um, I think maybe what I like doing the most is is uh, hanging out with my baby in my lap and reading a book. I don't know. That might be the thing. Um, nice. I've got another big uh, project. The yeah. I don't know when this will land, but. Uh, it either will about to, or will have just happened, um, that I will have launched another podcast for the Santa Fe Institute, uh, called complexity, which is, which is just the, uh, 
Cool. Yeah, conversations, except where I'm kind of like what we were talking about. Yeah, total noob sitting at the at the feet of like some of the world's leading scientists in in these areas and asking them questions about their research. And it's it's proven it started to mutate uh, future fossils. You know, it started to change the kind of conversations that I'm having at that show. And I'm, I, I hope that I hope that it, it doesn't just become a total inaccessible I, wank nerd fest. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's interesting you bring that up because I think maybe there's some kind of like uh, like morphic, you know, ripple effect or something, uh, you know, morphic resonant ripple effect or, or something like that. Or, uh, because I've been kind of moving into those conversations, too. And, you know, we, we've been talking about this and I feel like a noob. I've, you know, talking with uh, Chris Ryan and Charles Eisenstein and, uh, you know, Pinchback and just different people about these sort of complex I mean, Pinchback's last book, The Occult Control. I mean, it's like fucking Jesus. Um, I don't. <laughs> I'm. 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 I gotta yeah, interrupt I'm, you. I, I, I gotta interrupt I, you. Yeah. What do you think of that? Okay. Like, the occult control yeah, system. Yeah, frame, could you frame that for folks who don't know that Daniel's latest book is like the absolute most David Ike esque, like yeah. paranoid <laughs> reptilian conspiracy stuff ever, as far as I can tell yeah i i i um yeah so he's got another one uh, with sophia rockland called uh when plants dream so i think that just came out uh but the cold control system yeah it was like this little short book i i i'm i'm fascinated by that kind of stuff uh but I, yeah i don't know it, it it's i almost don't have any words for it because it was like I, I understand what, that he's like kind of presenting all these different perspectives and saying like, well, like, you know, according to the Gnostics, they say this. And according to Rudolf Steiner, he says this. And, you know, in Young's last book, he was talking about UFOs. And so he, he doesn't really kind of like present like a like a like an argument necessarily. He just kind of presents like a, a hodgepodge of of different perspectives and just saying, hey, something crazy is going on, but who knows what it is. So that's kind of how I feel about mm, that. Yeah. And for what it's worth, yeah. uh, I haven't read. Uh, when plants dream, but I did have Sophia Rockland on the show and she's an amazing mind. And I cannot, I, I highly recommend uh, you talking to her too. Yeah. We, we yeah. were emailing just recently. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to talk soon. Yeah. Definitely yeah, sure. someone who has colored more episodes of this show after our conversation than most. Um, anyway, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to derail awesome. you there. No, not at all. I don't even know where I was. There are no rails, <laughs> you know? So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, I love weird stuff, you know? So like, you know, David Icke stuff. I mean, like I'll watch, I'll watch some of his stuff sometimes, but I don't, I mean, I'm just, where is this coming from? Like I, one of the, one of the most pressing questions for me sometimes is like, okay, where is this? coming from like why and why are people buying into this fully it can't just be well it's just a bunch of stupid shit you know it's there, there's some sort of element of truth some nugget of truth somewhere in this you know and then there's some kind of story that's spun out of it and you know for a large part of it i think it's pretty entertaining but uh you know who the hell really knows you know that's that's my stance that's where i stand on that Fair. yeah uh yeah. let's let's think of um you asked me about about projects. Um, not really doing that much artwork anymore lately. <laughs> like, oh, really? I saw you yeah, posting some stuff about some, like, like new. I, I yeah. painted at music festivals for eleven years, and uh, then I got a full time job and had a kid. And I love to paint, but the. You know, I never liked the struggle of making my living as an artist. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, mm, yeah, I always was interested in too many other things to give it a hundred percent of my attention. You know, so I, I hear just, you, man. Yeah, I feel like you know, in situations like that, uh, it makes more sense to step out of the way and try to optimize for like if this is not something. If I don't know, I mean, I, I know that this is probably a wrong way of thinking, but my, my way of thinking is basically if somebody else likes this more than me, I'm not going to fight them for it, you know? And, and that like, if, if what do you, you mean? Know, I, so many of my friends are just extraordinary painters and that's all they love to do. 
And in a very real way, okay, yes, the world is abundant and we're surrounded by riches, but come on, like there are this many thousand people at the festival, this many hundred of them did not blow all of their money getting. Oof, that's a loud baby. Hold on just a second. This, I should probably get going in a few minutes here. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll end on like um, five. Is that is that cool? Yeah, like, you right. know, out of out of those thousands at the festival, you know, this much percentage of them didn't spend all of their money getting there, and that leaves a not perfectly de uh, determined, but nonetheless real pool of resources from which those painters that were not paid by the festival because the festival doesn't make the effort of tracking who is actually bringing people to the festival and therefore assuming that only the headliners are selling tickets and therefore not paying anyone else mm. and treating everyone else like it there it's you know this amazing thing for you to get to play on stage three or for you to get to spin fire without compensation or whatever yeah, yeah. there's this whole exploitative ecosystem around oh, it. oh totally yeah um and it's not just the non-musical performers it's the musical performers also and it's not just limited to festivals i mean this is true of the world in general that the, yeah and this is something that i used I to do stand up so I, I i you know I, I had the same thing happen to me so it's like yeah you've got totally. the voice for stand up <laughs> thanks man yeah you do yeah. you sound a lot like ramin nazer if you oh uh, yeah no Oh, I know. Yeah. For me. And yeah. Listening, listening to your episode together was probably confusing for people, but, um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So it's just, you know, I just, at some point, uh, you just have to say no to the insanity, you know, and be like, listen, I'm not going to compete. I'm not going to be forced into this like gladiatorial combat right. against my friends just because we all want to live as painters. Like, I think I can go find another job because I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm the electron most likely to get bumped off the atom or whatever, because I have I other hear what interests. You're saying. Yeah. You yeah, yeah. 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 And so, so, and so now you're working for the Santa Fe Institute. And so what, what are you doing over there? You're starting a podcast called complexity. That sounds amazing. I can't wait to hear that. Uh, what else? What, what, what's the primary function of I your mean, I run, node I run of the consciousness? Social media. So I am the one responsible for distilling these uh, scientific publications and the seminars and workshops that happen there, uh, boiling them down to uh, fit into the attentional framing of like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And then uh, for longer and, and deeper and more nourishing uh, discourse, uh, we've got a, a Facebook group that I started the day I started working at SFI called Complexity Explorers that has now almost 5,400 people in it. And nice. uh, it's a place where people can, can come to learn and to, you know, test their ideas and to meet other people that have non-overlapping genius and, you know, to share interesting stuff. And, you know, th for those who do not know, this, you know, this talk of complex systems and complexity science is just, you know, something that's happened over the last 50 years of science, realizing that you're not going to just figure it all out by getting to the basement level of reality that, you know, that, that you, that, yeah. that understanding the laws of physics doesn't tell you anything about life. Understanding biology doesn't really tell you, doesn't answer some of the deepest questions about society, you know? And so like, it's not just like, the whole thing collapses into physics. And then if you understand physics, you can explain everything. There are, you know, most of what matters to us, uh, human beings, most of what matters is something that defies our attempts to write laws, universal laws for it, and cannot be predicted based on just, you know, taking the thing apart and looking at its parts. And so, you know, this is really, this is a, a profound, you know, when you, to go back to your first question about, you know, yeah. where are we? Like, what, what is going on right now? Like, one of the things that's going on right now <laughs> is that we're realizing that the universe that we inhabit is essentially, you know, speaking in mathematical language, is infinitely dimensional. Not that there are infinite dimensions yeah. of space, 
I'm not talking about like DMT hyperspace either. I'm talking about uh, mathematical abstractions, you know, where it's like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the uh, the number of factors that you can consider, you know, that you can like the number of variables in the equation that you might write yeah. for this universe is functionally infinite. And so, you know, like I had uh, David Weinberger on Future Fossils and he wrote a book about machine learning. And he was saying, he's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, we may not understand what's going on inside some of these advanced AI systems and how they manage to come to answers that we've been able to prove, but we don't understand. You know, like the the machine can't show us its work uh, because it's it's not thinking, it's not reflecting on itself. It doesn't know what it's doing. It can't tell us what it's doing. And it's crunching so much data that we can't figure out what it's doing either. It's just drawing statistical associations between more things than you or I could draw statistical associations between. And we're able to extract a story out of that. And that in some way, even though this bothers a lot of people, the fact of it is that we've never been able to do this, that we've never been able to generate a satisfying narrative about, as what David said, how did you get a flat tire? Well, like, where does your story have to stop to be enough, right? Like, I ran over a nail. Okay, well, how did the nail get there? And then, like, yeah, you pull the whole thing up, and then pretty soon you're where, you know, Carl Sagan said, if, you know, if you want to bake an apple pie uh, from scratch, you must first create the universe, you know? I'm like, good fucking luck. We're not going to do it. (laughs) We're, we're, We're upgraded apes, you know? Like, we're really, Mm -hmm. we don't have... We, we, we cannot know it all. And, and in this respect, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to uh, some of the, the more sort of faith-based or, or theological people out there, uh, even, even though I don't necessarily agree with the desire to project a, a, uh, a subject into this transcendent mystery. But, it's like, but we can't prove that randomness exists, really, as far as I can tell. Well, you do, 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 you, do you get, do you, um, it sounds like, you know, do you hang your hat anywhere? You know, I mean, do you, do you, do you rest on anything or are you just, are you comfortable swimming in the, the sort of uh, agnostic ambiguity of it, of it all? Well, I forget which Zen master said, uh, great doubt, great enlightenment without great doubt, no great enlightenment. You know, uh, I know I live in a virtual reality created by, you know, a, a, an adaptive model producing kind of historical mashup of bio psycho ecological factors, you know, that like that the world that I, I see is not the, you know, the world that exists uh, in some sense for everyone. Um, I think really, you know, I think what, who is it that said uh, that it's like diving off a cliff only to find out that the abyss is a feather bed? Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Who who yeah, said that? that, that yeah. There is this that, that, that I, yeah. actually. Um, Let's just attribute okay, it to Mark sure. Twain. He said so many things. <laughs> or Brene Brown, I think. But, but maybe, yeah, but, yeah. But it's this yeah. thing. It's 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 that. Um, <laughs> Really, the places that we feel like we are safe, are comfortable, those are the places where we're most likely to fall. Or like that's that's the shit that's gonna crumble underneath you. You know? The the yeah. like I don't know what I am. That's there forever, my friend, right? Like that's like who is asking this question is probably the only that's probably the only question that you're going to be able to stand on for the next thousand years. You know, like there's, we're not going to come to a single unifying universal, infinitely generalizable answer to that. Everything else. It's like, we're just doing our best we can, you know, but who am I is like endless reward. You know, it just, it just continues to offer up new angles 
Right. Yeah. Who am you I know? today? Who am I when I'm in New York, when I'm in yeah. Santa Fe? Who am I now here, there with these people, with this project? Who am I thinking that this thought? Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, that's, that's the most fun for me. Totally. I mean, it's, yeah, I, yeah, it, it's, uh, Infinitely rewarding, I think, to always be entering in, you know, Zen mind, beginner's mind, so to speak, child's eye, um, figuring things out and enjoying the process of doing that and, and, you know, voluntarily and spontaneously coming together with other people that feel the same way. And so, you know, if the world's burning uh, around us, at least maybe we could try and put our heads together to come up with a new model that uh, that, that could uh, be some sort of like a you know, escape hatch or something, you know, so to speak, or just, just something, something maybe better and more attractive that can, uh, invite some more people that has the the ability to hold some more people in that want to participate in that, who aren't, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, drinking, drinking baby's blood, trying to live forever and then inventing, you know, (laughs) inventing, uh, uh, AI, you know, super suits to, whatever they're doing on that note i gotta say uh, when i had the tea fairy on future fossils you know she made a really uh kind of a canny and subversive remark in that in that uh direction and she said yeah go ahead and let the billionaires try out the immortality drugs first right like let them be the alpha testers like let them be the uh you know the tuskegee experiment here Right. Like if, yeah. if really, if like longevity drugs are not made available to everybody first, then if, you know, if they are the, the province of the ultra rich, then those are the ones that are going to get the like shitty B grade, like low resolution, like 2003 digital camera immortality. You know, yeah. I'm like, I'm totally <laughs> fine with letting them take that particular bullet. Uh, yeah. It's also the case. It's also nice. the case, however, that what I said is, is totally uh, evidential of my my utter lack of universal compassion, and that if I truly did not buy my own story about who I am, then I could hang out with anybody. You know, I could make friends with, I could learn from absolutely any person, because I wouldn't be like, oh, this person is the is of the variety against which I define myself through negation. You know. So as much as I, Mm. as much as I love and encourage the, you know, the getting together with people who think the way that you do, and then using the the power of the network effects of that to generate real change in the world. And as much as I believe that that's absolutely what's required in order to generate real change, because like, honestly, show me somebody, Elon Musk didn't do all that shit. The Joe Rogan interview is ridiculous. He's like, how did you come up with all this? He's like, oh, oh, I, uh certainly doesn't have anything to do with my like thousands of employees, you know, certainly doesn't have anything to do with the global supply chain and all of the unnamed people that are like throwing themselves under a train for me, you know? Um, Yeah. But at the same time, uh, homophily is what this is called. Uh, Our desire to be with people like us is without Mm -hmm, question mm -hmm. also contributing to these problems. So, ah, man. Yeah. Damn. And I thought we were going to end on a positive note. <laughs> Shit. Well, I mean, if you if you only hang out with people like you who are comfortable resting in a sort of fluid and provisional identity, then you'll all probably, you know, that probably will generate the greatest. Like if if your homophily is to hang out with other people that are legitimately woke and not just like, you know, trying to signal their wokeness to the world. Right. then you know yeah. that's that's probably even more effective than hanging out with all the people that want to participate in the same you know fist waving uh activist utility yeah. yeah yeah the show the charade yeah man yeah the the fucking commercialization of uh it's a lifestyle or that i consume yeah. i need uh, to make sure that i that yeah. i instagram pictures of me pouring water on the amazon you know, <laughs> yeah, you went, you, you did your part. Yeah. You went down there and you bought, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, Dasani bottles and sprinkled it on yeah. the Amazon. It's all good. You did your part. Hashtag, uh, well, I'm hashtag, inspiring like, other people yeah. to follow my example. So 
really it's not it's not ju- it's not even about me okay? right it's it's about the example that i'm setting for the world yeah you know <laughs> oh man yeah i feel like we could talk for more time but i i, I heard yeah. the the baby crying in the background i know you gotta go you're you, you know go 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 That's be with tough. your daughter and, and read a book that sounds fantastic you know at the end of the day Folks, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that uh, Illuminati reptilians are enslaving the masses to create a breakaway civilization to live in other dimensions of space. If you have a child, just spend some time with them and read a book. It's all going to be all right. (laughs) I mean, certainly if you're with your child, they're not going to they're not going to become you know. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, seriously though, at the end of the day, you know, it is, it is sort of those simple things I think that really keep us grounded, keep us human, keep us going and, and those, you know, enjoy those moments, you know, those, those precious moments, because, you know, uh, that's, that's where we are. That's what's going on. That's right now. How about that? Circle back. Yeah. Michael Garfield. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a great, great time. I enjoyed speaking with you uh, very much. And we should do it again sometime because I feel like we just kind of got the ball rolling here. We we spent a lot of time on complexity and that's fascinating. And I can't wait to check out the uh, complexity podcast. When's that going to be out? Is that out already? No, it'll be soon, though. Um, Cool. Yeah, it's. It, any day now. It's just uh, one of these things, you know, it's not just my, it's not my show. So it's, it's a show that I host for this thing that I work for. So gotcha. it's the thing's decision when it comes out. You no, know? I'm just, I'm just smacking a bone against the foot of this monolith, you know, <laughs> <laughs> keep smacking away. Yeah, my friend. There. It'll be a spaceship yeah. eventually. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks again for, for spending time here and, and, uh, and chatting. This was, this was great. So, um, yeah, send me anything that you want, uh, to me, include in the show. This will probably come out in maybe, uh, two weeks. So, um, so yeah, there you go. Thanks cool. so much. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. That's, that's the evolution talk, the music, the writing and the, the Patreon, which doubles as a, a, a show archive for future fossils nice awesome oh man you're so efficient yeah thanks a lot man i will i will spread you far and wide to the best of my ability and 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 i really i I really enjoyed this and i i do think now that we've i found our rapport we can have a much more like armchairy bullshitty kind of snark fest on on another time yeah cool man have a great night you too take care Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Hope you guys like these podcasts and enjoy them. And if you do, please spread the podcast, share it, tell a neighbor, tell a coworker, tell a friend, tell a cat, tell a mouse, tell a dog, tell an ant, tell a firefly, tell whoever you tell, share it, spread it, like it, all that good stuff. If you if you really love the show, you want to go a step further, you really want to help us out, leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts um, and go to patreon.com. Patreon slash Mike Brank and um, patreon.com slash Mike Brank. And you can donate as little as a dollar a month, $2 a month, whatever you want. Help support the show that way as well. But remember, I love you guys no matter what you do. I just love that you tune in and you enjoy these podcasts. Message me. I like hearing feedback. Get in touch with me on Instagram, Mike Adelic Podcast, Mike Brank on Facebook as well. And, um, but thank you once again to everybody. Thanks to Danny Barnett and Galaxia for the music, the intro and the outro. I love you all. Peace.